Are... Are you shopping for fancy lingerie? Why? It's not like you have anyone to wear interesting undergarments for. Hey, I am allowed to want to look nice for myself. Ooh, I know what you should wear. Make sure you wear it with your hair loose. Psh, that's not nearly risque enough. This is so much better. I can outdo you all. Just look at these. That's really sweet, but I'm not sure any of those are all that interesting by modern standards. You have said you just wanted to look nice for yourself. If that's true, why would you care about modern standards? It's that time of year again, when everyone is required to be excited about romance. Or at least about certain activities associated with romance. The holiday itself, and said cultural nonsense, is thoroughly not my jam. But you know what is? Interesting underthings. Hi, I'm V. Fashion historian who spent this past summer learning how to sew bras, so I will never have to deal with modern bra sizing again. And on the historical side, I make my own corsets too, because I have a weird skeleton and store-bought ones never fit. But it makes me curious. What is it that makes some underwear more exciting than other underwear? Sure, the details will change as underwear itself changes through the centuries, but we're all about context and social history here, and I think there will be some patterns to be found in several centuries of… romance. Yeah, let's call it that. Which brings us to the requisite content note. In this video, we will be discussing matters of human sexuality, and how they relate to fashion. Nothing graphic, as I like not getting demonetized. We're aiming to educate and amuse here. If you're not into that, this may not be the video for you. Click up there to check out my other uploads instead. If that is what you are here for, strap in and let's see how many euphemisms I can come up with for uh, dehydration-inducing undergarments. For the sources of said undergarment-related info, as well as Discord access and other bonuses, head over to my Patreon, where I post snarky bibliographies because I am a slut for good source notes. And perhaps even some bonus historical undergarment outtakes. Yes, there may be some of that also. And... I thought we agreed telling them to subscribe was your job now. Oh, right. Subscribe if you like listening to her talk. I'm gonna regret this, aren't I? Given the upcoming holiday, perhaps some of you are as tired as I am of being bombarded by advertising that makes everything about <clears throat> adding some spice to your life. So we're not going to do that here. Let me first thank Birch Living for sponsoring this video. Early access to their President's Day sale is live now and you can get 20% off your purchase for a limited time. Check out the Birch site for more details. Birch makes mattresses crafted with organic and natural materials that have been sustainably sourced. You know, mattresses for sleeping on. That's what they're for. Birch mattresses use no polyurethane forms or fiberglass. Instead, they're made from natural materials that accomplish the same things those potentially harmful materials are used for. They own their manufacturing facility, so they can ensure it's entirely fiberglass-free and use 100% organic wool instead for its flame-resistant properties, which is also hypoallergenic and biodegradable. My Birch Lux mattress has one of the longest list of third-party environmental and safety certifications I've ever seen on a textile product. Product. GOTS certified, Green Guard Gold, Fair Trade, Forest Stewardship Council. The Lux mattress is made of eight different layers of organic wool, organic cashmere, organic cotton, and 100% natural latex with a quilted pillow top for the perfect balance of softness and support. I've gotten a year and a half of amazing sleep on this mattress, which we all know is the only purpose of a comfy bed. If you love your Birch mattress as much as I do, you can look forward to many years with it thanks to the 25 year warranty. And if not, Birch offers a 100 night sleep trial. They'll even deliver your mattress right to your door rolled up in a box. And despite being tiny and disabled, I only needed a little help to unpack it and set it up. For bonus convenience, Birch also offers in-home setup and removal. What you do with your mattress is not the business nor the concern of this channel, but should you wish to do it in greater comfort and a more sustainable manner, this may be up your alley. I love my Birch mattress and I think you would too. If you're looking for a new bed, check out Birch Living. Early access to their President's Day sale is live now. It's the perfect time to upgrade your sleep with 20% off a Birch mattress plus two free eco rest pillows. Visit birchliving.com slash snappy dragon to find out more about this limited time offer. Yeah, we all know you only use it for sleeping, but you're boring. What have you been using my bed for when I'm not around? Nothing. 
of the much ado about variety. We are going to have a talk about this later. <sighs> All right, undergarments. I'm hoping to trace the descent of what we currently consider unusually interesting underwear, most of which is Western fashion. So it is with Western fashion that I shall begin in medieval and early modern Europe. It was relatively unusual for underlayers in the setting to be flashy. Ornate or colorful fabrics of this period were usually wool or silk, dyed with natural dyes, and not very easy to clean. To avoid the need for all over laundering and for comfort, the general practice was to wear a linen base layer under your outer clothing. This would keep sweat and body oils off everything else, and it took well to laundering. Click up in the corner for an entire video about how and why that works. So you generally did not see the level of color and texture and decorative variation that we are used to in modern underwear. Either it wasn't possible because linen doesn't dye well with natural dyes, or it was so ludicrously impractical and rare that we have no record of it. But there was variation. Linen fiber can be made into everything from coarse, rough, grayish canvas material to bright white fabric so finely woven it's sheer. Keeping one's underwear bright white took much more effort, first bleaching the fabric from its natural grayish color, then laundering it regularly, and going through the time-consuming process of bleaching stains and discoloration out using lye or ammonia and sunlight. While medieval art almost universally shows white underlinens, we do know that unbleached linen was cheaper and sturdier, so I think it's reasonable to guess that many people on tight budgets would wear unbleached grayish undergarments. Meanwhile, courtly romances like the Roman de la Rose idealize fine sheer fabric, and the possibility of seeing skin through it. We do have some medieval sources that describe silk underwear, but most often as an over-the-top luxury. One in particular, a 15th century Italian noblewoman called Elena Valentinus, is known for joining a convent after her husband's death and committing to forms of penance considered extreme even for her time, like a total vow of silence and putting stones in her shoes on purpose. She's quoted as saying she wore a hair shirt as a nun to do penance for wearing silk underwear as a noblewoman. I'm sure silk underwear was considered pretty attractive in the Middle Ages, but likely for the same reasons that very fine linen was too. It was expensive, and it implied that you had so much money even the clothes you didn't show off could be fancy. And sheer fabric is pretty regardless of fiber content. Finely woven, bright white underwear took time and effort and skill to have, either your own or paying for someone else's. And in the way of, well, societies, its significance as a symbol of wealth and status couldn't really be separated from what made it attractive. Yes, it's prettier to look at than the same garment made up in coarser grayish fabric, but the idealization came from how it was a high quality garment and how you weren't all that likely to see someone in just their underlinens outside of fairly private circumstances. To us, with our modern social context, this looks boring and shapeless and not remotely sexy. But most of the medieval sources we have about sexualized underwear are about context rather than the undergarment itself. In E. Jane Byrne's paper on underwear in medieval Arthurian romances, she describes multiple temptress characters who appear in the story wearing only their shift as a clear indication of their intentions towards the male lead. Sometimes this is positively portrayed, such as in Marie de France's 12th century poem L'Enval, about an ambiguously magical lady who chooses the knight L'Enval as her lover. And sometimes not, in the case of a chemise-clad temptress who tries to seduce the famously pure of heart Lancelot. There's a lot of discussion about how to translate Lancelot refusing to take off his underpants. It's hilarious. Would that more academic papers had a sense of humor like this. Lancelot refused to remove his briefs. <laughs> Lancelot retained his skivvies or his... What are BVDs? I... Good question. I have no idea. Apparently it's a brand name of underwear founded in 1876 that originally manufactured bustles. Are you after my job or something? Imagine Lancelot getting into bed and refusing to take off his bustle. <laughs> That's more like it. In the medieval period, embroidered smocks did exist, but they seem to have been somewhat unusual and are not often shown in art. The Roman de la Rose mentions a romantic heroine owning a white smock embroidered with flowers, which she packs to bring to court, and Chaucer's Miller's Tale describes an attractive young wife in a smock with black silk embroidery around the collar. 
We do have fragments of an extant smock from the 6th or 7th century belonging to Saint Bathilde, who had been married to a Merovingian king. It's embroidered in silk around the neckline in a style that represents jewelry, but it's also been identified as a funeral garment, so it may or may not be representative of what she wore during her life. Moving into the early modern period, fashions changed, textile production continued to improve, and it became a little bit more possible to add decoration to one's underlayers. This could be anything from simple ruffles at the collar and cuffs of a smock, to blackwork or redwork embroidery, to early forms of lace like reticella, which was handmade one stitch at a time and therefore incredibly expensive. Blackwork and similar embroidery was less labor intensive, but still indicated a certain degree of expense. You had the free time for purely decorative sewing. You'd have to launder the embroidered items carefully so the dye from the colored threads didn't bleed. Or you had the money to pay for someone else to do all this. But I want to point out, this decoration is concentrated at the neckline and wrists, which were the two areas of your linens most likely to show when you were fully dressed. Yes, it was attractive, but it was also intended for public view. That public versus private line is often the distinction between whether something was sexualized versus being considered good looking for other reasons like style, status, or skill. And that public-private dichotomy is what makes paintings like this so interesting. To us, this outfit probably indicates drama and maybe romance, but I don't think it's going to set your average 21st century viewer to fanning themselves. In the 17th century, though, this was daring. The artist Peter Lely is known for his Baroque era portraits of high status women of the English court, including a number which actual art historians seem to describe as romantic negligence. Instead of the structured public wear gowns of the Baroque era with stiffly boned conical bodices, sleeves pleated and tailored to puff and large full skirts, the subjects wear voluminous white chemises, often with ruffles. Over this, the outer garments range from simple draperies of fabric to loose robes of the sort called nightgowns, because you wore them at night, after undressing from your public clothes, before you got into bed. You didn't wear this out and about, you wore it in the privacy of your bedchamber. So the social context attached to these clothes implies a level of intimacy. When do you get to see someone in the clothes they only wear in the boudoir? In the clothes they wear to bed? You must be very close to them indeed to be in their bedchamber, in private where you and they could do anything you wanted. Not that Lely's portraits were only suggestive by context. There are a few that I will be having to censor to show you. Many of these portraits were of King Charles II's various mistresses. Honestly, with that guy, it's easier to keep track of who he wasn't sleeping with. I literally can't show one of Lely's portraits of the actress Nell Gwynn because there's no clothes at all. And even this tamer one has to be pixelated. But he did paint plenty of high status ladies to the best of our knowledge, who were not sleeping with the king, and who were of otherwise good reputation. It was fashionable and exciting to get a portrait done like this, assuming you had the status and money to make it happen. These are the 17th century equivalents of today's celebrity lingerie photo shoots. High status people in risque but very expensive and stylish outfits, whose status gives them the social capital to survive or avoid consequences in a way ordinary people can't. Okay, but you take pictures in your underwear all the time. In my historical underwear, which as we have just discussed is not very interesting by modern standards. Aren't you worried about your reputation? Why do you think I've never posted pictures of the modern underwear I've made? <sighs> Fair point. The internet needs to learn better manners. Those undies deserve to be appreciated. On that, at least we agree. Now, as she insisted on reminding us in my last video, shifts and chemises are far from the only ordinary item of historical clothing to be sexualized depending on the context. I can't believe I'm saying this, but she's not wrong. These days, thigh high stockings and garter belts are considered unusually sexy, probably because they're not a part of everyday dress. But it's not like they weren't considered exciting back when they were worn by most people. This is the bit where I get to drag knowledge from my hobbies into my work. Folk songs. Just in case you weren't aware, folk songs can get very saucy. Seriously, the number of folk songs considered genre standards and great examples of the art that are literally just someone being thirsty? Star of the County Down? Anyone? When it comes to stockings, I'm reminded of a particular Welsh song shown to me by my dear friend Anna, an actual folklorist. The singer begins by specifying that this year his girlfriend has taken to wearing blue stockings. It's 
Unclear to me exactly what the next lines describe, but I think it's that he often gets to see her in nothing but the blue stockings. The translation is colloquial. Most speakers in the audience have fun with this one. But what is extremely clear is that every other person who fancies the blue stockinged girlfriend is doomed to disappointment because the singer knows her preferences very well indeed. You don't have blue stockings? No, mine are green. Well, that must be why you're still sick. Don't make me throw a slipper. My feet are cold. I bet blue stockings would help with that. Garters, not garter belts, those are an early 20th century invention, but tie-on leg garters get an additional level of spice factor. Trust me, these were absolutely an every person, every day item of clothing. I don't know about you, but it is literally impossible to get my stockings to stay up without them. And if you ever see me skip them in a video, that is your giveaway that I am only getting dressed for the camera. While you might see a glimpse of someone stocking under normal circumstances, like walking around, garters were usually tied at or above the knee. You're not gonna see that by accident. So we once again get saucy folk songs talking about them. Madam I'm a Darling is one of those lovely examples of folk music where the plot is, I met a girl and we engaged in metaphors. One verse goes, Madam, I'll tie up your garter. Tie it up above your knee. And if you like, I'll tie it up higher. But speaking of garter belts, these are a perfect example of how, as textile production changed, so did our ideas of what undergarments could look like. When we modern folks picture a garter belt, we are probably imagining the version that is inherently decorative and sexy because they are currently mostly worn for decorative purposes. You don't need something to keep your stockings up. We have tights now. When they were an ordinary item of clothing, they could be just as plain and boring as granny panties compared to colorful laced ones. And I have a parade of extant examples for you as proof. Heck, the same was true of corsets in the 19th century. I did a video a while back about how corsets are basically bras in social attitude as well as function. You can click up there to see it, the whole thing. Colorful or stylish corsets were around, popular, and idealized. There are extants in bright screaming yellow and ornate brocades. There's a letter to a newspaper extolling the virtues of matching colorful corset and petticoat sets. And there's even this French cartoon describing the virtues and failings of various types of corset. I want to thank Liz Capism and my Discord members Claire Delune and Avalon LNK for helping translate this from French. These corsets range from the boring and old fashioned. 18th century stays are a defensive corset from whatever side considered to what modern people would use the term trashy for. A black satin corset is described as being unpleasant looking no matter how it's decorated, trying without succeeding to combine elegance with economy, and the ideal of the little washerwoman who is thinking of going wrong, as in sleeping around. A white moire bridal corset is described as stiff and graceless, not most often worn more than once, and apparently the best thing about it is taking it off at the end of the day. A tea rose leaf satin corset is obviously meant to be seen and looked at, must be easily to undo and especially to put back on, and is also a true combat corset? Are you gonna sword fight in a corset? No, I fenced for all of three months in high school. So what? You know tons of SCA types who fence. I do not have time for another hobby. Meanwhile, if you look at Sears catalogs and other sources for ordinary daily wear corsetry, the most common materials are white and beige cotton. Sure, seeing someone in a plain everyday corset was probably exciting for all the other reasons seeing a person is underwear is exciting. But there is that variation in how plainer versus more decorative versions of the same garments are thought of. I talked about this a lot in my video on historical pinup. What we see in these photos is the carefully chosen, ornate, decorative, attractive version of whatever the garment is. The ordinary, plain, workday under things worn by people who didn't have some reason to be photographed in their underwear are usually not the ones we have photos of. And there's some messaging in that too. The very idea of these are my pretty under things circles right back around to those social implications. Why wear the pretty under things instead of the normal ones? Anyone who gets to see you in these should feel very fortunate because you don't do this every day. 
This is why bridal underwear and nightgowns were often especially decorative, because this was something that pretty much all of society agreed you should be seen and appreciated by a partner in. This bridal nightgown is by Lucille, a British designer known for exotic lingerie in the early 20th century, and it's pretty much completely sheer. Or maybe you do wear fancy underwear every day, but not everyone gets to see it. With pinup, this is the fantasy the viewer is being invited to create for themselves. But in the real world, it's, well, real. So what can several centuries of old-fashioned lingerie teach us about what makes underwear sexy rather than just underwear? I'm noticing three patterns here. First, there's the difference between private and public clothes. Seeing someone in lingerie is attractive in a different way than seeing them in, say, an evening gown, because the lingerie implies an intimacy and possibility that an evening gown does not. Wearing clothes associated with a certain setting, like the Lely portraits of stuff only worn in the bedroom, or clothes that are especially sexualized, like modern garter belts, is the same principle. These clothes speak to an opportunity or an intention or both. This is not to support the idea that it's okay to direct sexual attention at someone because of their clothes, rather than because they've actually agreed to receive said attention. People are allowed to set whatever boundaries they like, and keep your feelings about my outfit to yourself is an entirely fair attitude. But I digress. Next, clothes that look classy or expensive. This is entirely context dependent because different societies will have different visual markers for status and quality, but because of how societal beauty norms have worked, attractiveness is often tied to traits that require a certain amount of status or wealth or some such to cultivate. It doesn't necessarily have to be expensive, but sexy underwear even today often calls back to higher cost materials like lace and satin, even though these materials can be produced cheaply today. This also doesn't account at all for personal taste because, well, we're speaking in generalizations and generalizations never do. But the personal tastes do come through strongly in the third pattern. Wearing an unusually decorative version of something, whether that's different in color, material, or cut, from a plain everyday version of the same garment. If someone has an audience in mind, it might be specific to that person's preferences. It might be solely determined by what the wearer likes or some combination. What all of these come back to is setting oneself apart from the mundane in some way. Whether it's aesthetically, through color and style, through using social ideas of attractiveness, or through the implied relationship that lets someone see you wearing the clothes in question. So what do you like that seems a little different? Wear something you know you love, or something that feels a little extra dramatic, or something you've never tried before. Heck, tie-dye your plain cotton undies if you like. I've done it. The most important thing is that whatever you wear, have fun with it. I mean, isn't that the point? I do hope you've enjoyed this lengthy mentioning of the unmentionables as much as I've enjoyed, well, coming up with all the euphemisms necessary to publish it. I literally can't think of something to ask you to comment on that won't turn into oversharing real fast, but uh, subscribe for more fashion history sass, and if you ring the bell, you might maybe sometimes, if YouTube feels like it, get notified when I post. You can find me around the internet at Miss Snappy Dragon on Instagram, Facebook, and very occasionally TikTok. If you want to come hang out with me on Discord and read those sweet, sweet source notes, all that is over at Patreon, and uh, I promise this batch of undergarment outtakes are in a very different vein than the last ones. Now you're just teasing them. When did you change clothes? What do you think? What are you doing outside your bedchamber in that? Your reputation will be ruined. Yeah, people are gonna think you're an actress or something.